a good number of people. Um, okay, so I want to welcome everyone to the um, always very uh, interesting and well attended uh, Health Policy and Bioethics Consortium. Today we're going to be talking about um, health information, or sorry, health misinformation. Um, my name is Aaron Kesselheim, and on behalf of, uh, of Leah Rand uh, and myself, we wanted to um, welcome everyone uh, to, uh, and thank you all for joining us today for what I, I think will be a really in, uh, interesting conversation. Um, just as a, a reminder on a technical level, um, we are going to be saving some time at the end of the conversation today for, um, uh, for Q&A um, with the audience. Uh, you'll see a Q&A button um, at the bottom of your screen. Please submit uh, questions to the Q&A feature. Um, you can feel free to submit them during the course of, of the conversations, and then way our moderator will um, will be able to see them and, and get to them uh, at the end of the of the ninety minute period. Um, we are, uh, as always, very Twitter savvy here um, at uh, the Program on Regulation, Therapeutics, and Law, and the Center for Bioethics. And so, if you have, if you do want to to live tweet about anything that you hear today, um, please use the hashtag Policy Ethics. Um, if any technical issues come up, please use the chat feature. Um, but if you have questions, please submit your questions to the Q&A feature. Use the chat feature only for technical issues. Um, and as always, if you are interested in the programming um, at the Center for Bioethics, you can see the um, link down there to um, be uh, added to the, um, to the uh, email list. Um, this consortium, is a monthly consortium that we run here. Uh, the goal is to try to uh, uh, dig into key issues in the healthcare system and public health, uh, bring together experts with different uh, perspectives or experiences to um, discuss these issues and propose solutions, and uh, ultimately to try to stimulate conversation and further um, academic study of the topic. Uh, just to give you a preview for what's coming up um, in this session in the future, um, we have next month's uh, session is a, is a combined meeting with the um, Bioethics uh, Research Consortium at the Center for Bio, uh, sorry, the, the, yeah, the um, Bio Biotechnology Research Consortium at the Center for Bioethics. Um, and we're going to be talking about uh, using gene drives to reshape our environment um, and the uh, health and ethical implications of that. And then um, next year, uh, our uh, agenda is already starting to shape up. We're going to take uh, the month of January off and then come back in February um, with an event co-hosted with the law school, um, focusing on using technology in the home um, and then access to assisted reproductive technology. And then in April, uh, a conversation on supplying international health with former World Bank President Jim Kim. Uh, but today, um, we are going to talk about health misinformation, and I would like to introduce uh, our moderator, Michael Sinha, who is then going to uh, take the opportunity to talk a little bit about this topic and introduce our featured discussants for the day. Um, Michael is a uh, physician and lawyer um, who also uh, has a degree in public health. Um, he is uh, a former fellow here at the Program on Regulation, Therapeutics, and Law, and is now an affiliated uh, researcher with our group. He is also um, a former fellow at the Harvard MIT Center for Regulatory Science uh, and uh, teaches um, widely on public health um, and intellectual property law issues and um, is, uh, is a, a, a perfect um, person to talk about this given how much he has um, thought about and published around uh, trying to provide accurate information about um, healthcare products to patients. So Michael, thank you very much for uh, moderating today and for uh, kicking off our session. Perfect, thank you. Share my slides. Everyone see my slides? And although they're not in slide right. mode yet. There we go. All right. So now you're just, I think you're just at the very end. At the end, okay. Oh, no, wait, it's the beginning. That was the first slide. My, my mistake. Sorry about oh. that, Mike. The same slide at the beginning and end. Yeah. All right. So this, uh, this conversation uh, is going to be uh, dealing with health misinformation in the COVID era. Uh, 
Um, so as, as some may believe that uh, this conversation really starts out uh, with the election of President Donald Trump in 2016. Um, soon thereafter, uh, there was an article, and I think a general consensus among policymakers, uh, that the administration was ill-prepared for a global pandemic. Um, enter the first major test, which was the COVID-19 pandemic uh, starting in early 2020 in the United States. Uh, Donald Trump made an issue of raising and really challenging the news media, uh, bringing up this issue of fake news. Uh, that narrative got translated very quickly into uh, the narrative for COVID-19. As you see here, this gentleman holding a sign, fake news is the real virus. So this led to a lot of uh, COVID-19 misinformation. Uh, one of the primary uh, vessels of disseminating this misinformation was through social media channels like Facebook, private Facebook groups, that sort of thing. Um, and so I'd like to break this down and talk a little bit about the various aspects of COVID-19 and introduce you uh, to some of the misinformation that has been spread. Uh, so the first was, one of the first things we learned about COVID-19 is how the, long the new coronavirus lived on surfaces. And so this really, uh, in my eyes, triggered a, a belief that we needed to, to really clean surfaces to eradicate uh, COVID-19. Um, so a hygiene theater, wiping down groceries, putting mail in a corner for three or four days before opening it, that sort of thing. Um, Soon thereafter, uh, you saw the World Health Organization and other public health entities arguing that COVID-19 spreads primarily from person to person and really focusing on droplets as the primary mode of transmission. Um, it was only later uh, that the conversation really moved to aerosol transmission of COVID-19 and the conversation expanded to focusing on ventilation and filtration, especially in indoor spaces. Um, the the uh, misinformation cycle was quick to, to call this airborne uh, COVID-19 and discovery false. Um, this became an ongoing talking point. And uh, what, what they essentially did was they took the evolving science and the evolving understanding of uh, COVID-19 and uh, protections that are needed and really turned it into something like this, something like a meme, uh, where they took Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's really been seen as one of the, the f leaders at the forefront of our COVID-19 response in the U.S., uh, starting out in March 2020, when he was quoted as saying, there's no reason to be walking around with a mask. By April, uh, the narrative changed. Americans should wear face masks. And then by January of 2021, double masking just makes common sense. And so by highlighting uh, this evolving and changing science, um, I think the intention here was to raise questions about whether or not the scientific community really knew what it was talking about. And so uh, you saw a lot of concerns about First Amendment claims, um, the idea that uh, masks are muzzles, um, that uh, people should be allowed to choose whether to wear a mask, uh, unmasking or masking of children became a hot uh, button item. And you'll see right here in the center, this really got linked to the reelection campaign of President Trump. Um, so misinformation about treatment. Uh, we started out with a President Trump at a press conference uh, noting, and I quote, I see the disinfectant that knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that by injection inside or almost a cleaning? So he is, of course, referring to uh, the, the survival of COVID-19 with disinfectants on surfaces. Um, but as you see here, some of the health of officials in his administration were frequently dismayed by the tone and nature of his comments and speculations. Uh, President Trump also admitted to taking hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic for COVID-19. Um, it took a number of uh, published studies uh, 
uh, to reiterate the fact that hydroxychloroquine does not prevent illness or death from COVID-19, nor does it treat COVID-19. We quickly moved on to another narrative, uh, the idea that ivermectin, uh, which is essentially a horse deworming agent used in uh, animal facilities, would be useful as a prophylactic and treatment for COVID-19. Uh, so you'll see here, ivermectin will only be sold to horse owners, must show pick of you and your horse. Um, and then on the right here, the FDA felt like it had to weigh into the situation and tweeted on August 21st, you are not a horse, you are not a cow, seriously, y'all, stop it. Um, misinformation about vaccines uh, also became extremely rampant as well. Uh, so we had two uh, extremely successful early uh, mRNA vaccines, one produced by Pfizer and BioNTech, uh, the other produced by Moderna. And then we had an adenovirus uh, vaccine that was produced by J&J. Um, the narrative increasingly turned to uh, resisting vaccines. Uh, hashtag say no to Bill Gates. There is this concern uh, that Bill Gates was somehow involved in a larger conspiracy. Um, COVID-19 vaccination equals death. So a lot of these narratives challenging uh, the, the fact that these uh, safe and effective vaccines were proven and really uh, driving people to resist uh, being vaccinated in the U.S. Um, same thing here, this uh, concept and idea that Bill Gates is injecting 5G or something along those lines, right? Um, this continues even to today. And so just last week, uh, Green Bay... Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers uh, identified that he was immunized earlier, uh, several months before, uh, but reportedly did not receive a vaccination. Uh, however, what he was taking was zinc, vitamin C, and ivermectin. And so the question I think would be interesting to, to start with and flush out here is this health misinformation a larger problem that predated COVID-19? And so I found this book that was published in 2017 by Professor Tom Nichols, The Death of Expertise. Uh, Professor Nichols argues in this book, the bigger problem is that we're proud of not knowing things. Americans have reached a point where ignorance, especially of anything related to public policy, is an actual virtue. It is a new declaration of independence. No longer do we hold these truths to be self-evident. We hold all truths to be self-evident, even the ones that aren't true. And he continues, to reject the advice of experts is to assert autonomy, a way for Americans to insulate their increasingly fragile egos from ever being told that they're wrong about anything. And so, the, the question we're going to discuss in more detail today, how do we address health information? Will watching this talk save your life? Uh, let's find out. And so we have two esteemed panelists with us today. Uh, professor Wendy Parmet is the Matthews Distinguished University Professor of Law and the Director of the Center for Health Policy and Law at Northeastern University School of Law. She also holds a joint appointment with Northeastern University's School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs. Professor Parmet is a leading expert on health, disability, and public health law, and directs the law school's JD-MPH combined degree programs. She has published articles on public health, bioethics, discrimination, health law, and AIDS law. She is co-author of two textbooks, Ethical Healthcare and Debates on U.S. Healthcare, and is the author of Populations, Public Health, and the Law. Uh, professor Joseph Capella is the Gerald R. Miller Professor Emeritus of Communication at the Annenberg School of Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Capella has been a visiting professor at Northwestern University, the University of Arizona, and a visiting scholar at Stanford University and the University of California, Santa Barbara. His research has resulted in more than 200 articles and book chapters and four co-authored books in the areas of health and political communication, social interaction, 
nonverbal behavior, media effects, and statistical methods. The articles have appeared in journals of psychology, communication, health, and politics. And with that, I will turn it over to our first speaker. Great. Let me share my screen. Okay, are we seeing the screen? Okay, great. So thank you for the opportunity to come here to talk to you today about misinformation. And thank you, Michael, for that uh, uh, very useful uh, introduction to some of the uh, history that uh, has uh, uh, been a part of all of our lives here for the last uh, uh, 18, 18 months regarding misinformation. This is obviously a big topic, and it's a topic that is uh, difficult to encompass in just a, a short period of time. Um, I will uh, restrict myself to misinformation about uh, the uh, COVID vaccine and, and COVID uh, era and not about uh, health uh, misinformation uh, more, more broadly. It's important, I think, to, um, it's important to make sure that we are talking about the same things when we talk about misinformation and disinformation and uncertain information. Uh, and the sort of standard definition about misinformation is that it is false, misleading, and inaccurate uh, kinds of information relative to the best available scientific evidence at the time. This is the definition that the uh, Surgeon General used in his most uh, recent, uh, recent report on uh, confronting uh, health misinformation. And so the claim, for example, that vaccines will change your DNA is a bit of misinformation. Disinformation. Uh, refers to misinformation that's intentionally uh, used to spread political uh, and uh, economic uh, uh, misinformation and to gain advantage as a result. So for example, um, recently some of the uh, kinds of, of uh, misinformation or disinformation in this case uh, that uh, occurred uh, in the New York City area was directed at uh, Polish communities and websites that uh, they were using and making the claim that mRNA vaccines were designed to, quote, annihilate Christianity in the Polish nation. These were uh, attributed to uh, outside male factors uh, and um, who were trying to carry out uh, political misinformation and create conflict and reactants uh, in the uh, Polish groups in the, in the uh, New York City area. Uncertain information is a little bit different. Here, the truth value is unclear. So for example, we really don't know the long-term side effects of the Pfizer vaccine. And so it's in uncertainty, uh, but it's not uh, incorrect to uh, say that the long-term side effects are not well known. Well, one of the questions <clears throat> that is uh, not whether there is misinformation, but is it still as prevalent as it has been as the, uh, as the uh, pandemic has gone forward? And I'll present you here with one slide from uh, an important uh, set of work that's been carried out by the Kaiser Family Foundation. And this slide is about the um, falsehoods that people uh, have been exposed to that they believe to be true or have heard about, but uh, don't know if they're true and, don't, and know if they're uh, and identify as potentially false. There are eight of them here. And this is a study that was done uh, very recently, just uh, third week of October and uh, for 1,500 adults in the United States. And uh, the eight, uh, um, the uh, eight uh, pieces of, uh, of potential uh, misinformation produced a very interesting finding, which was that um, overall, um, that at least that 80% uh, that of the population has heard at least and found to be either true or not sure that it's false, 80% uh, of the population has found uh, uh, at least one of these uh, tidbits of information, misinformation to be uh, acceptable. That's 80% still uh, a foot. And uh, a third of the population has uh, accepted four or more uh, pieces of, of misinformation as true. So for sure, uh, misinformation is still a foot in the United States uh, and it hasn't, uh, it hasn't gone away as the pandemic uh, has uh, changed over time. 
But it's one thing to say that misinformation is, is problematic. It reflects uh, sort of falsehoods uh, that uh, uh, indicate misinformation. And we all kind of presume that misinformation is consequential to behavior, such as the intention to uh, 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 obtain a vaccine, uh, a, a vaccine or not. And certainly there is, this is another slide from the Kaiser Family Foundation uh, study that uh, I just uh, presented to you. And if you look at the first uh, uh, pair of lines uh, uh, <clears throat> indicating COVID-19 vaccination status that compares the vaccinated to the unvaccinated, what you see is unsurprisingly that 64% of the unvaccinated uh, in the sample had four or more of the false statements that they uh, did not identify as untrue, whereas the vaccinated were you know, far lower in terms of the number of false statements that they accepted. And uh, other kinds of, of, uh, of differences uh, obtained that are consistent with uh, some of what uh, we, just, uh, we just heard about with the Republicans uh, having uh, many more higher rate of uh, four or more false statements, uh, <clears throat> rural and uh, uh, lower educated uh, uh, groups in the society uh, being more likely to accept the false information. So it would seem to suggest that in some ways, the misinformation that is present is, is misinformation that would be consequential in affecting people's intentions to become vaccinated. But, and this is the title of this of the next slide, just because the two things are associated doesn't mean that there's a causal, causal relationship. And so a lot of the data that we have about misinformation and vaccination rates and beliefs and uh, other uh, unfavorable uh, uh, consequences uh, is information that is really just associational. There are a few studies, one of which uh, came out um, in uh, 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 October of uh, 2020 that uh, was done in the United States and the, uh, uh, and the uh, United Kingdom using 8,000 cases. This was a clinical uh, study showing uh, experimentally exposure to misinformation versus accurate information that uh, indicated that there was a lower intention to vaccinate after exposure to just a few tidbits of misinformation. And these uh, kinds of studies have not been widely, widely replicated. And this was pre-vaccine, of course, um, because it was uh, October of 2020. Uh, these kinds of studies have not been widely replicated and the Office of the Surgeon General's uh, uh, statement on confronting health misinformation still uh, holds uh, that uh, there is a kind of, of more causal association between misinformation and vaccine intent and vaccine, uh, vaccine interest. This slide just indicates what a, a few of the kinds of misinformation that were used in the, uh, in the experimental study of the previous slide. And they're kind of outrageous uh, bits of misinformation. mRNA vaccine will alter your DNA. All the monkeys initially receiving the coronavirus uh, vaccine contracted the co coronavirus. These are uh, hugely incorrect claims that were a part of the prior study showing its effect on, uh, on intention. So there's some evidence, uh, though it is not uh, overwhelming or strong, that the misinformation that the people accept uh, can have consequence for their vaccine uh, acceptance, their vaccine confidence, their vaccine uh, hesitancy. Um, but the, the data is not as strong as uh, we might like it to be. Um, now, I think we need to ask about, you know, why is it that misinformation is so uh, common, that it's so prevalent in the society at large? And I think, of course, the first thing I'm going to do is blame the media, uh, because the media has a role in communicating this uh, misinformation. And I want to talk about two, uh, two media sources, the, uh, the more legacy media, which is the, the media uh, like Fox News, uh, like the New York Times, the Washington Post. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, um, um, Fox News, and, and, uh, and other uh, broadcast sources, uh, as well as uh, social media. But first of all, the legacy kinds of, kinds of media. And one of the reasons, of course, that the legacy media covers misinformation is because it's novel, it's new, and they, they uh, consider it to be a potential threat. And so media should cover that kind of threat. So that's one class of reasons that uh, legacy media is covering uh, this kind of misinformation and uh, doing so uh, fairly extensively. 
It's also the case that groups like Fox News um, have a bias that's political. And so they're covering the misinformation because they have a political agenda in mind and they're trying to pursue that political agenda. My concern is the following, and it, I think it was a very nice uh, quote from Charles Blow in the New York Times uh, just about uh, uh, a couple of, uh, couple of months ago, in which he says, sometimes the light you shine on evil also illuminates the path to it. Sometimes publicity is advertising. And the point that uh, Blow is making here is that when these kinds of misinformation are covered and you're doing so because you're trying to do a public service, carrying out that public service also makes that misinformation available to the, to the audience. Uh, one of the technical ways we, we describe this in media effects research is what's known as priming, that, the, that mainstream media is often priming uh, information that is, um, that is um, uh, uh, misleading uh, and, uh, and invalid. Um, and even though they may be debunking that information as a part of their coverage, they're still covering it and it becomes a part of the, uh, the uh, uh, informational base that people have at their, at their disposal. Another slide from this uh, uh, Kaiser Family Foundation study of uh, the of middle of October. Uh, this compares uh, several different media sources, three uh, highly conservative ones, Newsmax, uh, One America News, Fox News, and uh, uh, four, um, more liberal ones, NPR, uh, MSNBC, Network News, ABC, CBS, NBC, and CNN. And what it is doing is it's focusing on people who already trust these sources. So obviously it's gonna be more conservative sources uh, and part, uh, participants on the top three <clears throat> and more uh, uh, democratic uh, and liberal leaning uh, participants in the, bottom, in the bottom four. And what you see here is uh, again, not terribly surprising, but that the number of false statements that um, participants who uh, trust Newsmax and One America News and Fox News, the number of false statements that they uh, are, are finding acceptable is substantially higher than is the case for those who are exposed to and trust uh, NPR, MSNBC, Network News, and, and uh, CNN. So this is consistent with what we're expecting to be the case, and we've always expected to be the case in the mainstream uh, legacy media in terms of its, uh, its, its impact. It doesn't tell us that these sources are affecting people's uh, 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 vaccine intentions or outcomes, but it is telling us that it is at least reinforcing and confirming uh, the dispositions that that audience might have. And I want to make the point to you that there are two kinds of effects from me media uh, implications. One kind of effect is sort of a direct causal effect where somebody's intentions to get a vaccine are affected by misinformation in a kind of direct way. There's another kind of effect that is more confirmatory where that effect does little more than take an already existing predisposition, a predilection, an attitude and reinforces it with information that is consistent with it. It's a kind of, uh, sometimes goes under the name of a congeniality effect. The information is congenial and simply reinforces an existing attitude rather than uh, calling it uh, into question. Uh, and, and that I think is as much a media effect as, as not. Let's move over to social media and I'll take a couple of minutes to talk about one study. <clears throat> I don't, like to, don't wanna talk about studies in uh, any real detail, but I wanna talk about this one because it's a very important one by Vasugi that appeared in, uh, the, in science in 2018, um, essentially before the, uh, the pandemic hit. And this was uh, an, a, a study of Twitter over a 11-year period and uh, focused on over 126,000 uh, news stories that had been tweeted over four and a half million uh, times. And what they found in this study in a very carefully done line of work was that lies that were identified as lies by six different fact-checking sources uh, uh, moved fa farther, faster, and deeper, and more broadly uh, through the Twitter sphere than did truths uh, and truthful information. And you might say to yourself, well, did people really know the difference between lies and truth truths? And the answer was no. But what, what, uh, uh, what was the case was that the lies were more novel 
the, the lies were more uh, uh, induced more fearful response, more disgusting responses, more re uh, uh, surprise responses in the recipients. And those characteristics, the, <clears throat> the novelty of the information, uh, what they elicited in others, differentiated the, uh, the lies from the truths. And so in effect, what this, this shows is that information that is uh, uh, more novel, uh, fear-inducing, fear disgust-inducing, and surprise-inducing moves more quickly through social media uh, <clears throat> and uh, more deeply into social media and across more different places than uh, does information that is more truthful and therefore, as it turns out, less novel and less emotionally, emotionally evocative. And so <clears throat> the presence of misinformation in social media is extensive, but it's not often the result of many, many people gen generating originally uh, misinformation. It's, uh, it does seem to be some evidence that uh, there are a very small number of sources that account for uh, up to 65% uh, of the uh, online uh, vaccine disinformation. And uh, one particular actor here that's gotten uh, some attention, um, perhaps wanted, perhaps uh, unwanted attention, Dr. Joseph Mercola in the New York Times uh, has been uh, cited as one of the people who has uh, generated a huge amount of, of misinformation uh, through, uh, through social media. The other thing that is not quite obvious about uh, social media uh, information is that as it is repeated, as new information that is untruthful is repeated, there is an interesting effect that the repetition alone of unfamiliar information uh, increases the assumed truthfulness of the information. This turns out to be a remarkably robust finding. Uh, it's, <clears throat> you might, uh, you might poo-poo it and say, gee, that's not, uh, that's not possible. But when you take into account that, the, that often this is information that is unfamiliar or not uh, well known to people, then the repetition of that information uh, has, it, it has consequences for how truthful that information is seen, seen to be. So we have this kind of, of phenomenon that we, I think, all understand to be the case, but it is a very significant phenomenon. And that is that, that lies move more uh, quickly through social media, they move more deeply into and through social media. And the greater the repetition, the greater the likelihood that those lies are seen as having a, a more truthful character um, than they would otherwise. Just this past July, uh, as we moved during to the uh, Delta era from a period in which it looked like we were going to potentially escape the, uh, the pandemic, uh, <clears throat> as uh, the number of cases jumped up, so did the falsehoods uh, that uh, occurred in uh, social media uh, in from just uh, June to just June to July, they went up 400% on falsehoods about a vaccines not working, about them containing microchips went up 150%, uh, natural immunity up 111% as more uh, useful than vaccine uh, uh, kinds of immunity, and vaccines were uh, were uh, touted as uh, as uh, uh, falsely uh, causing uh, miscarriages. So the Delta upsurge uh, essentially reactivated what was going on in social media at the, at the time. So why do people believe misinformation? Obviously, we have a tendency as human beings to need to have uh, accurate uh, information because uh, that accurate information allows us to survive in the face of threats and so on and so on. Um, but uh, misinformation is, uh, is believed for a variety of kinds of reasons, some of which are not completely obvious. One of the more obvious is that uh, misinformation is believed uh, in part because it uh, is seen uh, uh, to be compatible with prior beliefs. Um, this is sometimes known in, among uh, social psychologists as biased processing or motivated reasoning. But we see it, for example, in the African-American community where uh, prior beliefs about the abuse of uh, a medical system uh, through the uh, horrific Tuskegee experiments undermined, at least initially, African-Americans willingness to participate in, in uh, vaccine legitimacy and be greater accept the, uh, a greater likelihood to accept uh, misinformation because uh, it uh, bought into their prior uh, concerns about Tuskegee and the mistrust that it, uh, that it produced. Um, also, um, misinformation 
um, tends to uh, tell a, uh, a, a, a coherent story. And coherent is here not a logical coherence or a scientific coherence, but a coherence of ordinary reasoning. So if the story is that Big Pharma wants you to uh, get uh, vaccinated and, they want is, and, and, and the reason they want you to do that is because they will cash in, then that's consistent with the kind of ordinary reasoning that people have about uh, big uh, institutions uh, in a capitalist uh, society. Also, the, uh, the information that's a part of, uh, of misinformation sometimes have, has a little tiny tidbit of truth associated with it. And so when there's discussion of the mRNA uh, of, of uh, components of the vaccine and then linking those to genetic alterations, it's not as far a leap uh, as uh, might be the case, but for the, uh, for the uninformed. You know, a, a fourth reason is ordinary credibility. People who talk about uh, misinformation and talk about their reactions to uh, specific situations are often talking about their direct experience. I know a person who, or this happened to me. And that kind of ordinary credibility carries a value that is uh, sometimes uh, greater than uh, might be the case for a more didactic, uh, a more descriptive kind of set of, set of claims. Um, a very subtle tidbit of information about, um, uh, about misinformation is that it has a tendency to persevere. Now, you might say, well, okay, that's it's gonna be hard to dislodge misinformation. And that's true. Uh, it is hard to dislodge misinformation, but sometimes even if you can dislodge the misinformation, you may not be able to dislodge the underlying emotional tone that has been created by that, uh, that disinformation. This is sometimes, uh, this has uh, been uh, uh, studied under the label of belief echoes. The, the belief uh, may be able to be dislodged, but the underlying affect that that belief carries isn't completely dislodged. Now, one of the things that's interesting about uh, examining some of the bases for these sorts of, of, uh, of uh, psychological components to the acceptance of, of information is that it points us to the way in which you may need to respond to that misinformation in the messaging that comes later. If there's an emotional residue, your messages probably need to have an emotional component to undo that residue, even if the, uh, the, the, the belief's uh, truth value uh, has been successfully uh, altered back to a more accurate uh, representation. Uh, uh, another uh, reason that misinformation is more readily accepted is that, uh, is that in, the, in the modern media era, we have many, many different sources of, of information. These uh, informational sources are kind of siloed in some senses, and people uh, take advantage of their psychological dispositions to go after a uh, phrase that I used before, congenial information within an information silo. And by, by staying within that informational silo, they don't expose themselves to uh, uh, contrary information and end up confirming their existing biases uh, that are consistent with the misinformation that they had. And this is, this is not a characteristic of the media, it's a characteristic of the media system uh, as being uh, siloed, uh, siloed information. And in those silos, of course, are, guess what? People who are like you, who have testimony that is like uh, your uh, predispositions already. This balkanization of communities in terms of interests and in terms of siloing is a, a, a effect that reinforces existing misin misinformation. And of course, during the pandemic, all of this has taken place in the context of a high degree of uncertainty and anxiety, a change in lifestyle in fundamental ways. And as a result, uh, conspiratorial thinking can, can arise to fill the vacuum that is uh, there uh, from the uh, uncertainty and lack of, uh, of, of information about how we're going to proceed and how we're going to get ourselves out of this pandemic situation. All of which points to the fact that we are in a situation uh, in which <clears throat> the uh, psychological predispositions that, uh, that exist open us to accepting misinformation, uh, reconfirming that misinformation within silos,
and within uh, groups of people who have uh, 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 who are consensually uh, like us in the, in the first place. And there's some components of those stories that make them sound coherent to an ordinary person and that uh, have the effect of, uh, of uh, staying and sticking uh, against uh, attempts to dislodge those uh, sorts of beliefs. Now, uh, the question of course is, how do we respond to, to misinformation? And this is where the world of communication uh, meets the world of psychology and social psychology. And uh, there's a lot to say about this and I will, uh, I will not try to say too much about the ways in which uh, communication can work here, but I wanna begin with and talk about what we should not do and when then turn a little bit to what we should do in terms of the kinds of communicative strategies that we might undertake. Uh, probably the most important thing that I can say to you today um, is that facts and education are not enough. We need to use uh, the full array of persuasive strategies uh, that, may, that, that, that uh, are uh, responsive to the misinformation that's, that's present, but at the same time, um, do so in a way that maintains the truth value of what we are saying. We don't want to turn persuasion into propaganda because we don't need to. But we do need to avoid being simply didactic, simply factual, simply descriptive. That is problematic. And I've had more than a few arguments with my colleagues in, in public health who say, well, let's just, uh, let's just give them the facts. The Joe Friday approach does not work. Uh, not in general, it doesn't. It might uh, at some stages and for some people in some uh, populations. But we need to take full advantage of the persuasive tools and strategies at our disposal. What are these? There are a lot of them, but I'll just uh, I'll wave my hands over them in a, in, a, in a couple of slides forward. Be careful about repeating the lie. Um, the, the evidence here is not uh, uh, clear or unequivocal, but instead of uh, worrying about whether the evidence says it's OK to repeat, the, repeat a lie and then debunk it uh, versus not repeating the lie, the safe thing to do is to not repeat the lie. And so here, it's more likely to simply state the truth <clears throat> or to uh, ask a question that doesn't repeat the lie. Don't talk about the hundreds of monkeys who did not get the, uh, who did not get the coronavirus after vaccine um, because it, it uh, makes clear what the, the lie is. And so uh, it raises questions in people's minds. And, and you get, once again, you get to this notion of inadvertent priming, inadvertent cueing of the information that uh, you may wa not want to be in the business of cueing because you're trying to uh, you're trying to get rid of that misinformation. It's also not necessary to respond to every lie um, because there are some lies which have very little reach. Um, they uh, uh, you know, circulate in very small communities and responding to them just gives them uh, the light of day. And so it's not always a good idea to respond to every single lie. Uh, but certainly it's, not, it's important not to assume that uh, the knowledgeable people are going to be immune to misinformation. Turns out there's good evidence to suggest that uh, people are, uh, are, uh, who are knowledgeable are immune to misinformation when they don't care about the information. But when they care about it in some important way, it's involving or it's a part of their identity, then suddenly they become as susceptible to misinformation as do other people. And <clears throat> um, final point here under what not to do is, is to not quit. Um, there's really three things that it's important to do with the communication when you're uh, carrying out a campaign, and that is that you need to be clear, you need to be consistent, and you need to be credible. Um, but you also need to do that over a long period of time, especially now while we're facing the, the, uh, the remnants of the final uh, 15 to 20 to 25 percent of the, of the population that is not interested in uh, being, being vaccinated. And so uh, same with the misinformation, and that is to be persistent. But I want to talk about some of the way, well, I'll, I'll at least mention some of the ways to avoid uh, being persistent without being, uh, you know, a pain in the neck. Um, this is an example of, uh, I think, of a, of a bad use of, uh, of, of the debunking of misinformation. Uh, this was about uh, 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 messenger RNA, uh, which uh, carries genetic information according to the US National Cancer Institute. These vaccines would instruct cells to produce protein that resembles part of the COVID-19 virus. Notice that. These vaccines would instruct cells 
to produce a protein that resembles, all right, that's first of all, that's very complicated. Secondly, it sounds like these vaccines are going to instruct our cells to do something, and they are, but if you're uh, naive about it, as most of us are, um, it sounds like there is some intervention by the vaccine into the proteins that are a part of the, of the, of the immune system. My point here is not to uh, uh, talk about uh, anything other than the, the fact that this message, which is purely factual, is too complicated, it's unclear, and it provides just enough of a, of a link to, uh, for the, the misinformed to produce the conclusion that messenger RNA somehow is inter, inter, intervening, affecting uh, potential sources of uh, genetic, uh, genetic uh, information. And that's despite the fact that there's an explicit denial of that in, in, the, in the message. This is not a good response to uh, <clears throat> factual misinformation. What about what we should do? Uh, uh, there's a lot that we should do to respond appropriately, but the kinds of things that I'm gonna mention in this slide uh, are a little bit unusual ones. One is, uh, of course, the, the notion that it's important to surveil, that is to be in the surveillance business Associated with uh, mis with misinformation and the on top of that uh, on top of that misinformation, so um, uh, a lot of this is being done by uh, by uh, newspaper groups, by uh, academic groups, and so on. And uh, it's starting to be done by uh, by uh, grant grant work uh, being uh, funded by the National uh, Institutes of Health. Um, you've got to it, people will respond to information if you can get it in front of them. And so somehow entering the information silos that are pro pro um, promoting misinformation is, uh, is crucially, crucially important. Um, you need to make uh, the acceptance of uh, uh, legitimate uh, information visible. And so um, the example of Aaron Rodgers was given, but on the other side of that, among uh, athletic uh, folks who have been very positive and uh, uh, very pro-vaccine and uh, pro-accurate uh, information is Charles Barkley. And so <clears throat> making him a, your social uh, influencer. Uh, a fourth kind of approach is to inoculate uh, people. Um, by inoculate, we mean, in this case, a cognitive inoculation, not debunking the information, but if it's possible to pre-bunk, that is to give people uh, a heads up that information is uh, going to be misleading and it's gonna be crucially important for you to uh, be on your guard. And that can have a, a, a very good effect at minimizing the impact of, of misinformation, but it can only happen uh, after the, in advance of the misinformation, not to, uh, after the misinformation is well established. Um, and two last, uh, two last observations here. And um, this has to do with the notion that um, narratives are indeed important, but they need to operate within the disbelievers' world worldview. So, for example, there was a lot of concern that uh, the vaccine development was very fast, and that uh, um, uh, that speed uh, undermined its uh, its uh, accuracy, its legitimacy, its reliability, validity, and so on. But on the other hand, the mRNA technology that was behind it was were years in development, and so one can create an alternative narrative about the. Uh, about the um, uh, speed with which the vaccine has been developed and take advantage of what uh, the disbelievers are already accepting. And that is that it was done fast, but take advantage of by saying that that, that speed um, was in, in response to a technology that had been long-term in development. A final approach is, uh, is a, a little bit similar, but it is to affirm the worldview of the targeted in the targeted uh, subgroup and then debunk that information. So for example, a uh, community vet, you know, saying that the community that you're talking to values doing the right thing. So that's an affirmation. And then talking to that community about um, how, what it means to do the right thing, to think, research and do, and do what's, do what's right. Uh, these latter two are not alternatives that are well explored in the in the communications literature, but they are, I think, important kinds of approaches. I'm not gonna go over this slide. I just wanted to suggest to you that there are 
uh, three broad components to persuasive strategies. The, the messaging tools, the need to do those, use those messaging tools with a credible source, uh, that means trustworthy and expert, and to do so in a way that the relationship to the audience is preserved uh, and that they are not, uh, uh, that they are not uh, mis, uh, um, uh, talked down to or treated, treated as a, an equal partner and, and so on. These are some of the tools for uh, that information. Um, finally, I think we have faced a series of, of, of significant conundrums that uh, we uh, have to uh, engage and have to simply uh, acknowledge. And I'll just talk about the first one here, and that is uh, we can say that information should follow the science, and that's fine, and the information should follow the science. But as uh, <clears throat> our initial speaker pointed out, the science, um, sometimes changes. And when the science changes, uh, that means that the information, if it's gonna follow the science, is gonna have to change as well. And that's gonna lead to inconsistency, uh, a, a problem with potential clarity, and will undermine credibility. And so this kind of conundrums are problematic uh, for all of us to deal with, but uh, it also reflects the fact that, the, that, that science is a changeable process and uh, the world is a changeable uh, set of events. And, one needs to be responsive to what's going, what's going on there. My final slide here is that um, we need a lot more rigorous research to guide the next campaigns um, because we have been operating on a shoestring in the uh, campaigns that are being carried out against uh, the uh, COVID misinformation. Um, and we've had to use uh, data and uh, 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 literature that doesn't quite fit we also need to be addressing the needs of high disparity, uh, high effect, highly affected communities and minority communities, not only to deal with trust, but to address systemic trust. And of course, we have to deal with institutional interventions uh, and in response to the way in which those uh, institutional interventions might or might not run afoul of the First, uh, First Amendment, uh, which I think is what our next speaker is going to spend some time talking. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to just jump right in now, but um, thank you for the introduction and the transition to the First Amendment. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Um, so thank you. I'm going to follow up on that great presentation about the problem and some of the do's and don'ts and the science of the do's and don'ts to talk about sort of what's law got to do with it or more precisely what the First Amendment has to do with it. Um, a couple of background points before we get going. First of all, although the First Amendment's text speaks to what Congress can do. It says Congress shall make no law. Um, for almost 100 years, the Supreme Court has held that the First Amendment applies through the 14th Amendment, one of the Reconstruction Amendments to the Constitution, to the states. So the amendment limits both the actions of the federal government, Congress, and actually all the federal government and states. Secondly, it doesn't apply to the actions of private actors. In popular discourse, it's common to talk about the First Amendment not as a legal doctrine, but sort of as a general social norm um, supporting robust and free speech. But the amendment itself does not apply to the speech of private actors. It doesn't have anything to do with what I say today. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with what private universities say or other private figures, and I'll come back to that. But it's really important, I think, for us to think about sort of the larger social meaning of the First Amendment as a sort of pro-speech principle and the legal impact of the amendment itself. On the other hand, the First Amendment, especially as the Supreme Court has come to interpret it in recent years, really significantly limits the government's ability to regulate private speech, including speech that is injurious to health. 
Um, in my talk, though, I want to thought it might help to break this down into a couple of different categories because not all speech and not all misinformation is created equal. For purposes of this discussion, I'm going to focus on four different categories of health-related information, all of which have played a role in the pandemic or the infodemic. Okay, so first is the ordinary speech of private actors. We'll come back to that in a second. Second is the professional speech, primarily the speech of health professionals in discourse with their patients, but perhaps, and I'll talk about this more broadly. Third is commercial speech, the speech that's related to the marketing and sale of products. And then fourth, government speech, think President Trump, or I noticed somebody in the uh, chat or Q&A asked about the Surgeon General of Florida. So we could talk about government speech. I'd like to start with private speech. This is the speech that the First Amendment protects the most robustly, right? Um, and it's the speech, as I said a moment ago, that I'm doing right now. I mean, it's public in the sense that this speech is not, you know, private between me and my best friend or me and my family. I'm saying in a publicly available forum, but it is private speech. I am a private actor. This is non-governmental speech. Okay, when Aaron Rodgers talks about COVID vaccines, um, and Dr. Sinner talked about that, right? Even though he's a public figure, a really famous public figure, um, it's private speech. This is the type of speech that the First Amendment protects the most robustly. Although there are a few types of private speech that remain subject to some regulation, think defamation or perhaps, and I put that, say that purposely with some curiosity right now, incitement to violence that the government can relate, regulate. In general, government regulations that are based on the content, what is said of private actors is, are subject to what we call strict scrutiny. This is the most stringent form of judicial review. So to give an example, a law that said you can't say anything negative about vaccines or a law prohibiting vaccine misinformation or any particular type of vaccine misinformation, vaccines have chips, they'll magnetize you, right? Any of that would be subject to strict scrutiny. So too would a law that prohibited individuals from saying, and even if they're shouting it off the rooftops or posting it on social media, that ivermectin cures COVID. Misinformation, potentially dangerous information, not regulable. Once a regulation or subject to strict scrutiny, once a regulation is subject to strict scrutiny, the burden is on the government to show that it is the least restrictive means of achieving a compelling state interest. Traditionally, public health has always been considered a compelling state interest. And where regulations of speech related to health would get into problems is on the least restrictive um, means part of the analysis. I will say that uh, last month, um, kind of shocking to me, three justices of the Supreme Court um, in a decision refusing to take a vaccine case suggested that it wasn't clear that stopping the pandemic or protecting people from COVID-19 would remain a compelling state interest. I have to say, it's hard to know if that's not a compelling state interest. What is a compelling state interest? Certainly more people are dying of COVID every day than probably would die from shouting fire in a crowded theater. Right? We've always assumed that some speech that was dangerous could be prohibited. It's not at all clear to me right now what is a compelling state interest or what health is. Um, in any case, it's very hard, and it has been very hard for many a year now, to regulate danger, even dangerous health-related misinformation. On the other hand, regulations that are so-called content neutral, 
so-called time, place, and manner regulations, the classic example, no loud noise in a hospital zone after 10 p.m. These are subjected to a less rigorous form of review known as intermediate scrutiny. Here, the government must show that the law serves an important but not necessarily compelling objective and is narrowly tailored to achieving that and that there remain other forms of communication. I don't think this has a lot to do with the misinformation problem. There were a lot of uh, cases that talked about this early in the pandemic. For example, people challenged shutdowns of theaters, and concert venues as regulations of speech. And the court said, well, those are not content neutral. They weren't just shutting down theaters that talked about the virtues of vaccines and not the ones that talked about the dangers, right? It's not, it's content neutral and the courts upheld those. Professional speech. A couple of years ago in 2018, in a case called National Institute of Family and Life advocates versus Becerra, which had to do with a so-called crisis pregnancy center. Um, the Supreme Court stated that professional speech was not a separate category of speech and that regulations, content-based regulations of speech were not considered differently than other forms of speech. On the other hand, in that same opinion, sort of at the other side of their mouth, um, there's an opinion by Justice Thomas, the court conceded that it had long accepted certain traditional right forms of regulation of professional speech, malpractice law being a great example, informed consent law, and probably professional licensing law. So, you know, if I go um, to the doctors and I say, should I be vaccinated? And the doctor said, no, it's going to implant. And my, my physician said, oh, that will implant chips into you, false, right? Um, and I don't get vaccinated and I die of COVID. Um, it's probably malpractice, right? Um, and the First Amendment, the court, in a sense, conceded in NAFLA, a view that has scholars have long accepted that the First Amendment doesn't prohibit these kinds of traditional regulations of healthcare professionals. Okay, importantly, the regulation that is set and where the First Amendment allows is the regulation. Is, is the professional standard itself. So if reasonable physicians and it's physician, you know, medical consensus to tell people that COVID vaccines have microchips in them, that wouldn't be a malpractice. I'm obviously assuming that that is not the medical standard. Um, what is less clear is whether the speech of professionals is fully protected by the First Amendment when uttered outside of the context of a physician-patient relationship. Right, we want professionals to be able to debate, to advance science, to criticize each other and their findings, right? I mean, that's part of the process of science itself. But what if a physician uh, gets on TV, right? And this has happened and says, you know, COVID's a hoax or vaccines make you sterile or any matter of other misinformation. Or what if a group of physicians as has happened, uh, sets up a website and says that COVID is a hoax and ivermectin is the treatment, the only needed treatment. Can they face licensing recriminations? Okay, they're not giving this information in the classic physician-patient relationship, but they're using their stature and credibility as physicians to disseminate false and dangerous information. Um, my colleague, Claudia Haupt, with whom I've written about some of this, she believes, and I think she's right, that such speech can be sanctioned by professional licensing boards, um, that physicians really are under an obligation um, not to utter falsehoods, right? It's not a dispute about the science. It's to really go and utter falsehoods in public ways, in ways that can be harmful. But I will say that that is not, you know, that some people will disagree with our uh, conclusions about that. And I also want to be clear that we're talking about, in, in this case, misinformation. Supposing a physician gets on TV or social media or tweets and says, you know, vaccine mandates are tyranny. That statement 
might in fact lead many people to say, well, if the physician says that, or famous TV doctor says that, it must be vaccines are dangerous. That's why mandates are tyr tyrannical. But, I, but that statement itself is not, of course, false. It's a normative statement of policy judgment and probably clearly protected by the First Amendment. I want to talk a little bit about commercial speech, another category, and think here about drug ads or think about the ads on the websites that I referred to before that also, you know, tell you that vaccines are dangerous and also sell t-shirts and other goods to uh, push their viewpoint. Um, the Supreme Court first applied the First Amendment to such commercial speech in, to, in the 1970s, right? For almost 200 years, it was assumed that the First Amendment had absolutely no application to the regulation of commercial speech at all. In 1980, in a case called Central Hudson, the Supreme Court laid out a four-part test for the regulation of commercial speech. And the test, without going through all the details, made clear that governments could regulate false and misleading commercial speech. And even if speech is true, they could regulate it in some circumstances subject to pretty much what's known as intermediate scrutiny. But in more recent cases, Without overruling Central Hudson, the court has moved to ever increasing First Amendment protection, even for commercial speech. Presumably, the court still allows the regulation of false commercial speech. So again, if I try to sell ivermectin and tell you that it's the best thing to protect you from COVID, probably can be subject to regulation. Um, but I will say it's really important to understand that the court's application of commercial speech has made it very difficult now to police false advertising around drugs that we could talk a lot if we want about what this means for the FDA's ability to regulate. But the court is really pushing towards sort of a more speech, better speech, deregulatory approach. Equally important is the government's ability to compel speech. So usually when we talk about the First Amendment, we're talking about barring speech, limiting speech. But the First Amendment also protects against compelling speech. And in the commercial context, and particularly in the FDA context, we have required warning labels that, you know, the makers of vaccines have to give some specific information, right, that the FDA requires them to carry. Um, and this area is also uncertain right now. Um, in, uh, in the same case I mentioned earlier, uh, the NIFLA case, the National Institute of Life and Family Advocates, the Supreme Court suggested that compelled commercial speech may not be permissible if the, even if the compelled speech is true, if the speech is controversial. And the truthful information in that case dealt with abortion. And this actually led my colleague Claudia and I, a pre-pandemic, to opine, could you imagine that any information about vaccines, because there's a large debate in the population about vaccines, could no longer be compelled? And I throw that out to you again. I feel like I think our concerns were a little prescient um, in, in, a, in a bad way back then. Um, if anything is Controversial, if it can't be compelled, could the FDA require warning labels for vaccines? I leave, to, I leave that question to you. And then there's government speech. Throughout the pandemic, we've had government actors at all levels. Uh, Dr. Sinner mentioned President Trump. I mentioned there have been a lot of them uttering misleading claims and offering dangerous advice. Now, again, sometimes it's, it, it's not so much that it's false, but it's, you know, suggestive. And if we really want to parse what President Trump's, you know, he didn't say go ingest bleach. He sort of wondered whether people should ingest bleach. And how people hear something is, is an important question. Traditionally, the First Amendment does not limit the regulation of government speech. In fact, the government can regulate 
the government speech. And we want the government to do that, right? We, I should be able to get up and say smoking is great and doesn't cause cancer, but we don't want the CDC to put on its website and says, well, some people think smoking causes cancer and some people don't, or, right? I mean, we, we want government to make, regulate and ensure that it is not content neutral. In addition, um, we want the government, let me back. Another reason the First Amendment doesn't apply is because we often think, right, that the remedy for government misleading speech is more speech and electoral accountability. And unfortunately, I think for many of the reasons we just heard, that doesn't work very well. In this particular informational environment, um, first of all, health-related speech can have a direct and imminent harm, just like shouting speech in a crowded theater, but also people are siloed, people hear what they want. If you're a Trump supporter and Trump offers misinformation, you, are, you don't hold him accountable and you believe it. If you're a not a Trump supporter, you hear him say it, you assume the opposite is true, even if what he says is true, right? We're, our informational environment is so affinity-based right now in deeply troubling ways that traditional First Amendment ideas and remedies don't necessarily work. In um, a forthcoming paper, Claudia and I analogize uh, government speech to bad professional advice and argue that it should be subject to the same kind of regulation as professional, bad, erroneous professional malpractice. Um, but that's an argument. It, it, it certainly is not something that courts have followed. Let me end with a few concluding thoughts so we have some time for discussion. First of all, free speech, the debates that the First Amendment allows, can be really important to public health. We're focusing today on the misinformation and the downsides. But we could talk about many instances where freedom of speech has been critical to disseminating important health information. If you look at, for example, just go back to the early years of the HIV epidemic, um, it, it, it took courage to inform people about how HIV was transmitted. One would not want to live in a society where that kind of speech could be barred. Likewise, we want debate among science, right? The first scientific information is not always accurate, right? So free speech and the debate among scientists are critical to public health. On the other hand, I think that the evolution of the First Amendment doctrine in the past two to three decades, combined with the current informational environment, particularly as created by social media, permits the proliferation of misinformation in ways that make it increasingly dangerous. And so one of the things that's happened is we not only have a social and media environment and an algorithmic environment that often favors the dissemination of misinformation, but we have a First Amendment doctrine that is new, that is more robust, that allows less regulation and controls on speech, including, importantly, commercial speech than we've had in the it really is important that we understand that what we say the First Amendment allows and requires today is not what was the case for most of our history. The hope is that we can fight misinformation with more or better information is naive, as I think so the way. La Dr. Capella's presentation said, just more information that love you said the Joe Friday approach does not work. Um, but that was the traditional First Amendment answer. So I would like to argue is that one solution lies with a return to a more traditional First Amendment jurisprudence. This doesn't mean chucking the First Amendment, which we can't, of course, do, and but nor would we want to do. But it might be to returning to a more nuanced application of professional speech and commercial speech doctrine that um, allows 
some space for holding people responsible and accountable for when they're spreading very dangerous misinformation. And I will stop with that. Hopefully allow some time for conversation. Terrific. Thank you both for uh, incredibly detailed and nuanced presentations. Uh, the, the first question I have uh, for the both of you, uh, trying to sort of fuse uh, the different approaches uh, that you've taken to uh, discussing the topic of health misinformation, is looking at the role of loyalty and morality in the dissemination of health information and health misinformation. Uh, given that the discourse around COVID-19 has been intensely partisan and may actually be uh, more affiliated with a political party, um, perhaps one that doesn't align with one's background, affinity, or moral compass. Do you think there's a danger in damaging the credibility of information by classifying a policy or value judgments as misinformed facts? I'll jump in. I mean, I do think there's a danger. I think the line between misinformation and, um, you know, normative arguments with which one might agree or not agree can often be difficult to discern. I do think as a, as a lawyer, you know, we have uh, ways and mechanisms in our law we all long have had, right, of understanding when information is misleading, understanding what a reasonable person would uh, hear it to mean, right? So I, I think there are tools for that, but I definitely think we need to be sensitive. And I do think that um, the public health side, and, and I think probably most people in, in this um, event are on the public health medical side of it. I think we do need to be careful of not condemning um, arguments over values and principles, which we may believe to be dangerous and wrongheaded with misinformation, right? So saying the government should not be able to mandate vaccines, vaccine mandates destroy freedom. I mean, that's something I intensely disagree with. But that's not misinformation. Saying, you know, the government is putting microchips in me with vaccines and they magnetize me, that's misinformation. So we do need to be careful about that. Yeah, I mean, I think there, you know, you know, what uh, Wendy just did was point to clear cases. And I think when there are clear cases, then I think uh, labeling them as misinformation is, is fair and legitimate. And actually, you know, we've done that, um, you know, we've done that forever in, in communication campaigns of, of all sorts. Sometimes it takes a long time to get to the point of saying this is indeed, you know, accurate versus inaccurate as, as certainly was the case with, with uh, the work uh, in, uh, in the area of tobacco, uh, <clears throat> you know, as being a health hazard versus, versus as a, health so a healthful source of, of uh, influence. And once, you know, once that happened, um, then it became legitimate to, you know, call out tobacco companies and um, public health officials who were misrepresenting what was happening with, uh, you know, with that uh, domain. And I think the same is true with, uh, you know, with, with COVID. The other thing is as to the question of, you know, re uh, of, of uh, treating a claim as uh, somehow representative of a personal, of a personal freedom um, I can understand uh, when people do that and why they do it and so on, but uh, sometimes in response to that, it's not to call that you know a falsehood, but to reframe the discussion uh, in some ways so as to you know talk about other responsibilities, not not necessarily to deny the the desire to maintain uh, one's personal decision making. I mean, you know, we know that personal decision making is limited. <laughs> And it has to be, you know, has to be uh, uh, balanced against uh, responsibility. So, I, you know, I think reframing those discussions rather than trying to deny a person's point of view is an art form, but it is, uh, you know, it is something that's doable from a communications point of view. Can I just add your comments about uh, tobacco? Reminded me. I think we do need to under recognize, you know, that a lot of the 
dangerousness of tobacco advertising was not actually the false information, right? It was the aura, the style, the, the puffery, the, the image they were trying to convey. And when I, when I talk about how the First Amendment has changed, I think it's important to realize that probably if, if we were trying to bar TV advertising of tobacco, of cigarette ads right now, the Supreme Court would not allow it. I think that that's pretty clear, right? Um, Congress barred TV advertising of cigarettes, you know, way back in the 60s, because not because the information was false. It was, it was, they were selling an image, but the image was dangerous, right? Because people were buying it and, and, and smoking in enormous numbers and dying in large numbers. Um, if that hadn't happened then and the tobacco companies hadn't agreed to it because of the settlement, um, we probably couldn't do that. And I, that's where I talk about, think that the evolution of the First Amendment is leading us to somewhat dangerous place. Great, thank you. We have a couple of questions that I'm trying to fuse here. How granular do you think information in public discussions needs to be? And do we actually hurt credibility of information through an inability to communicate science and nuance. Uh, and then uh, following up on that, uh, should we be tapping into fields like epistemology and social psychology uh, to help address questions of credibility, credence, fact, and assertion? Um, Go back to the, go back to the first of those questions, which I think is separable from the second. Can you repeat it. Sure. So, how granular should the information in public discussions be, and do we hurt credibility of information through an inability to, to communicate nuance and uncertain science? So, one of the principles of of <clears throat> old line mainstream journalism is uh, the so-called KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, and it becomes very difficult to, to represent the subtleties of a scientific claim. Um, it becomes just as difficult to sometimes communicate that what you're saying as a scientist is consistent with the prevailing science. And in the process, trying to imply that it's, a, it's very possible that the science <clears throat> will change um, and maybe in the not so distant future. And so as a result, you know, communicating that contingency and getting people to buy into that contingency while we are also saying things like, follow the science. The science will, you know, the, the, the truth will make you free. The facts will make you free. But in fact, we simultaneously say to the audience, or at least we try to, that uh, science is a, uh, is a transient um, um, set of claims in, uh, in, in response to the available knowledge. And we know the scientific claims change over time. A wonderful book by Paul Offit called, I um, um, can't remember the lab, uh, uh, Pan's Laboratory or something like that, um, talks about uh, six cases of clear change in, in well-accepted science uh, and what uh, led to those changes uh, over a course of sometimes, sometimes decades. But you know, we've seen in the pandemic changes and in, in, in fact, uh, you, you, referred to, <laughs> you referred to a couple with regard to the masking claims by, uh, by Dr. Fauci. Um, and you know, he was uh, trying to make claims that were consistent with the available uh, knowledge at the time. And that undermined the claims about masking. Great. Uh, there's a question here, a, a couple of different questions, uh, again, that I'm trying to fuse, but uh, thoughts about how to handle health misinformation that comes from presumably credible sources, such as Florida's new Surgeon General. 
And then what about if it comes from celebrity physicians like Dr. Oz? Well, I think that actually those were the, some of the examples I, I was thinking about without being quite so daring to name. Um, as I said, I believe that, um, frankly, the medical profession has not been as vigilant as it might be and could be about celebrity physicians giving uh, dangerous misinformation. Um, I think that that's a real problem. And I think that um, they really should be enforcing. I have to say an analogy I have here, we, we thought about was, you know, think about some of the statements that um, Rudy Giuliani made, right? He's a lawyer and, and we've now seen um, some bars, bars, state bars going after his license, right? For public statements. So I, I think that there's space for that. And I think it's something that the medical profession really needs and state licensing boards need to take more seriously. With respect to government speech, as I said, you know, we believe that it should be analogized to a form of professional malpractice, but that's certainly new ground and pushing it. But it is important to recognize the First Amendment does not apply to government speech said by government speakers in their government capacity. So actions brought against them should not be protected by the First Amendment. Great. So, so I noticed, I, I saw, and uh, Professor Capella noted in his talk that uh, U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy recently released a community toolkit for addressing health misinformation. Uh, is this a welcome addition to the tool source, or uh, perhaps is this too little too late? Well, I, I don't think he generated a toolkit. I think what he did was uh, he he set out a call for action um, <laughs> rather than a set of strategies or a set of uh, 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 approaches. And I think if you uh, look at that document uh, carefully, he ends by uh, by talking about the various constituencies that need to be responsive, that, that need to be involved in dealing with um, misinformation as a problem. And he, you know, he goes to, <laughs> he goes right down to the individual uh, that, and, and essentially says to, you know, to all of us, you know, we need to be more careful in terms of what we're willing to accept uh, uh, with regard to health information uh, as we are making decisions for ourselves and making decisions for our family members. But he takes it all the way up to, you know, the National Institutes of Health themselves. And so, for example, one of the things that has happened in, uh, in NIH uh, is um, that uh, there are you know, various initiatives, which uh, we don't really need to talk about, that are pertinent to misinformation that have suddenly come out. Uh, Social Science Research Council also just come out with some big uh, requests for uh, uh, intervention and uh, and uh, funding uh, consistent with dealing with uh, with health related misinformation, whether it's COVID related or not. And I think um, I I can't say that <laughs> that it was because of Dr. Dr. Murthy's uh, uh, call to action or not, but uh, it certainly didn't hurt. Great. Um... Just ask, uh, since we're running out of time, if uh, you would like to give uh, a brief, I, I generally consider this like a, a tweet, a 280 uh, character a synopsis of your thoughts and ideas um, to take home as, as we move forward. Well, I, I mean, I, I think I, I tried to uh, mention what I thought is the sort of key key issue in all of the work that uh, I've done for a very long time and continue to do, and that is that we have to balance uh, our concern with providing factual, didactic, descriptive um, uh, explication of information with persuasive tools to make that information uh, engaging and effective in terms of acceptance, um, which is not the same thing as saying we propagandize our health information. No, not at all. In fact, what we're doing is we are simply making our health information more engaging, 
and more likely to be effective and using all the tools at our disposal to achieve that. I'm gonna pick up on the word balance um, because I think that's so critical here. We often in this country think about speech, freedom of speech as all or nothing, right? On the one side is just unfettered discourse, no matter how uncivil, no matter how dangerous. On the other side is, you know, some is 1984, Stalinist Russia. We need to come back to a balance that we've had for most of our history um, with a great space for free speech, but also with some modest, reasonable protections to protect public health and safety, whether it's in the selling of drugs or whether it's in the misinformation about drugs or vaccines or disease. Terrific. Well, please join me in thanking our esteemed uh, panelists uh, for a uh, lively discussion on health misinformation. Uh, we'll certainly uh, more questions than we could answer today, but uh, please do continue the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag policy ethics. Thank you all for attending. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Mike, for moderating, and we will see everybody next month. Thank you.